Hi, I'm Marilyn. I have a passion for making art and for teaching art, and teaching art in a way that makes it fun, convenient, and easy. Have you ever been stumped for what to paint? Well, today in this video, I'd like to show you how to create a series of paintings of a collection of things that you have around your home. If you're new to this channel, please subscribe. And as always, the links to all the materials are in the description below. Let's get started. The other day, I, I wanted to paint something, but um, I really didn't know what. And I didn't feel like tackling a quarter sheet or a half sheet of paper. So I was digging around in my art closet and I found this bag of 300 pound watercolor paper that I had cut into five and a half inch squares. I think the plan was to take it on vacation as an easy um, pickup art project. Anyway, they've been hanging in the closet for a while, but they seem just the right size for some mini portraits. Portraits of things that I could probably find around my house, like flowers or fruit, uh, vegetables, shoes, fishing tackle, coffee mugs, shells. Oh, shells. Well, like every good Florida girl, I have a big basket of shells from every time I go to the beach, I pick up something. And I decided I would paint some small shell portraits. So I'd like to share with you the steps that I took to create a series of small paintings that can be displayed as singles or could be displayed as a set. And we'll take a look at why creating a series is a good thing for most artists. I started by selecting a few shells from my collection and I photographed them with a distinct light source and in a way that I thought showed off their best side. In looking at the red orange or burnt sienna, that I see in most of the shells, I decided that I wanted the complementary color of blue-green for the background. I sketched each shell on one of the squares of paper. Now, I didn't try to draw all the tiny details, just the big shapes and curves. And then I taped the squares to a board so that I could apply the first layer of paint across all six pieces of paper. Using a spray bottle, I misted the paper with water and started haphazardly dropping the blue-green on the paper, varying the intensity and the balance of blue and green. Uh, artist Amanda Evanston calls this a chaos layer. I knew I wanted the final background to have a sense of texture and I wasn't going for a flat wash. And I was perfectly fine with some of the blue-green being on the shell. Having little bits of your palette throughout your painting creates harmony and you have less of a chance that things will look like they're pasted on. You don't want the object to look pasted on to the background. I used a tissue and kind of dabbed and picked up some of the paint where I thought that might give it a little more texture and lighten some of the, the areas. I also splattered in some of the um, red orange or burnt sienna for even more texture and more harmony. And you'll notice that I left plenty of white space, particularly on the sand dollar and the alphabet cone shell, which have a lot of white in there in the makeup of the shell. After letting the chaos layer dry thoroughly, I used a mixture of the blue and the green to paint the space around the shape of the shell. This is called negative painting. It is one of my favorite techniques in watercolor. And we're going to do more with negative painting in an upcoming video. Again, I tried to vary the balance between the colors. Sometimes a little more blue, sometimes a little more green. Um, and I threw in a little bit of the red-orange every once in a while, again, just to keep things interesting. I'm, I'm not going, again, for a flat wash. And you can see that some of that previous layer peeks through, which, again, creates more interest and creates some variety. The strategy is to work across all six 
pieces of paper that I have taped to this board, and uh, you kind of get the idea of negative painting. It really is about creating the object by painting the space around it. I think you can see how this goes. I'm going to finish up the other five shells and uh, I'll be back with you in a bit. They've all dried thoroughly and I've taken them off the board. And one thing I've noticed, especially with 300 pound paper, is that sometimes you need to go back and catch up that white edge. You don't want to have that glaring at you uh, when you framed or mounted your, your pieces of art. Now it's time to give each of these shells some real personality. I'm going to show you how this, uh, the steps that I take uh, using the sand dollar. First thing I do is fill in those small uh, spaces on the sand dollar where the background would actually show through. I still have some of that color on my palette, so no worries. And um, I'm not trying to do anything other than to make sure that that shell is anchored to the background at this point. The next step is to think about where the light source was and to begin to add a very dark um, line that I'm going to feather out to be the shadow of that shell. Again, the shell doesn't sit flush with the the background, it, uh, it's irregular in one of Mother Nature's creations. So I have a little bit of license, creative license here to play around with this shadow shape. Now I've just used a mixture of the blue-green, the green, and the burnt sienna to create a dark, dark, dark teal. I'm going to use that same shadow color to indicate the place where the light does not shine in those little openings, those little keyhole openings of the sand dollar. I'm a real fan of the darkest dark next to the lightest light. And one of the things that I like to do in my artwork is really push that range of values. And I might even exaggerate it. It's certainly exaggerated over what you see in the photograph. But to me, that's what, again, gives this some depth. So I'm going to take each of those openings, add the darks, so that we get the sense that there is some space there. Now it's time to work on that lovely design that, that sand dollars have. It's really not a marking as much as it is a raised place on the shell. So I'm using a grayish blue mixture, again using the same colors that I had originally on my palette, and I'm just creating a shape and then I'm feathering it out a little bit with some clear water, some clean water. I do use a round brush. Um, golly, I have tried my darndest to get uh, familiar with flat brushes and I just don't seem to have the same comfort level. So I'm using a number eight round. Again, as always, the links are in the description below. But as you can see, I'm not trying to be too precise. I want this to have some variety and irregularity to it, which is what Mother Nature would do. And I'm just trying to indicate that the shell dips a little bit, so there's a little bit of a shadow area created just by how those five points of the sand dollar seem to build up or um, lay on that sand dollar surface, on that circular surface. And again, it's just a blue-gray mixture, lots of water to feather it out, make it soft. I break the edges up. Sometimes they uh, stay solid. Sometimes I totally blend it out. always keep a tissue in my one hand because uh, I like how I can lift and uh, soften some of the edges. I put a little bit of too much of the uh, rust in that one and I had to go back and add, again add more water. Water's your friend. I've decided that the sand dollar itself has a few more bumps and 
um, irregular surfaces to it. So I'm using a watery mix of that shadow color, laying it on, adding more water, dabbing some up if I feel like it's too strong. Not really a plan as much as kind of letting that brush dance across the surface of the sand dollar to give it some variety in its texture. It's not one solid flat surface. I want to go back and darken those keyholes just a little bit and now I'm going to use that same darker color to indicate the little dotted spaces, uh, dotted lines that you see in the sand dollar design. I don't try to make them regular. Uh, I skip spaces. I might put five little dots, skip a space, put four, two. Um, but the idea is to give the impression of those tiny, tiny little holes that are in the surface of the sand dollar. Molly's of the mind that you uh, need to trust your viewer to fill in the gap, so I don't need to put in every single little mark because I know the viewer is going to see this as a sand dollar and fill in those spaces for me. Last but not least, I've decided that some of these edges need a little more curve to them, and so I'm going to darken the edge just a little bit and not all the way around, just in spaces. And that will give, again, that sense that the sand dollar has some shape to it and some contour. I'm going to finish up the fine details on the sand dollar and then I'm going to start on the other shells. I'll catch up with you in a bit. Well now I have six shell portraits that are ready for framing. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to go cut up some watercolor paper into five and a half inch squares and you'll need at least three. I use 300 pound watercolor paper. If you have 140 pound paper on hand, that works perfectly fine. Next, you're gonna go snooping around your house to see what you have that you'd like to study. Look for interesting shape, interesting texture, and think about what you'd like to spend a little time studying. The value of a series of paintings is that you think deeply about the subject. And that deep thinking makes for better art. Well, that's it for this lesson. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And next up, I'm going to show you a way to frame these paintings, these small paintings, without a frame. No mat, no glass, no frame. So check it out. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you real soon.